This morning, I want to share with you from Romans chapter 6, verses 14, 13 to 14, just reading to you from Romans chapter 6, verse 13. And it says, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And from a casual reading, a simple reading of these two verses, uh, it tells us that, well, you can offer yourself, you can present yourself, the members of your body, and everything that belongs to you, it would include that. Uh, you can present it as instruments of unrighteousness, or you can present yourself, uh, your, your, your body, as uh, instruments of righteousness to God. In other words, you have a choice to make. And, and in life, there, is, uh, there, are, there, are, there are two paths. There are two paths for us, and we have to choose which path we want to walk. Even Jesus said to the people, there is one path that is narrow, and there's another path that is wide. So you have to choose which path would you walk. As believers, then Paul is presenting to us here that there are two paths. And one is to prepare, uh, present yourself as instruments of unrighteousness, the other one is where you present yourself as instrument of righteousness to God. My wife and I, we went to a shopping mall and we you know, just look around and pass by one a silver accessory shop and, and we went in and took a look and casually talked to the sales girl, sales lady. And you know, the, that lady is very friendly, very chatty, and she started talking and telling us about herself. Uh, she told us about those items that we were looking at, uh, explaining it to us about those silver items. And then she also talked to us and told us about herself. And she said, oh, you know, she is a, a, a single mother. She has a kid. She herself is about 25 years old, maybe 26 or 27, around there only. And <coughs> she has a kid of 10 years old. I said, wow, you are so, it's so uh, you know, you are so, I mean, blessed uh, in that sense, you know. You, you, you already have a kid at such a young age. But of course, she recognized that, hey, you know, uh, this is something, being a single mother is not easy. And she says that this is something that she has chosen. Uh, it's a, she says that uh, in Cantonese, that means she has chosen that road, that path herself. She ended up as a single mother uh, at a very young age. And uh, so, so she has to work hard you know, to take care, to bring up her kid. So there are choices, there are paths in life that we walk. <coughs> and talking about righteousness, we want to, we must uh, then understand what is righteousness. When we talk about righteousness, we look for a person whose life is a life of truthfulness, a life of righteousness, things that are right, a life that is free from sin, a life that is free from guilt, moral and virtuous, uh, justified morally uh, with that uprightness and rectitude. One who shows honesty and, of course, integrity. And so it is like, you know, a very big word that envelops all of these ideas about what righteousness should be. Well, politicians claim and talk and say that they, are, uh, they represent righteousness. They will tell you how right uh, they, they live and, and how right they would, uh, what kind of right things they would do. And because... Uh, very soon, we're going to hear more of that, right? And, uh, and, and uh, why? Because they, they want you to vote for them. 
See? So they will tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you vote for me, uh, that's what I represent. That I'm going to lead the country, uh, your, your stage, or your, your, your seat here, parliamentary seat, or whatever, uh, with righteousness. But, of course, we know that even the uh, uh, righteous politician, people can still find fault with that person and, and can sue that person for something that. Uh, legally, probably is right, but they can still find fault with a righteous person like them. Even robbers have a sense of righteousness. You say, oh, pastor, you mean right? to rob people is so considered as righteous, a uh, righteous person. Well, many years back, uh, many years back, lately I've never heard about it, but many years back, uh, when some, someone get robbed, and then uh, they, the robber would give back you know, 10 ringgit or 20 ringgit to the, the, the victim and say, this is for you to take a cab home, you know. Well, so they also practice righteousness, you know. <laughs> uh, but nowadays, I, I don't even hear about that at all, you know. Uh, let, let me show you from this uh, picture, this pictorial uh, uh, slide. This Subordinate, okay, the, the thief looked to his boss, looked to his, uh, his, his head and asked, do we also practice Tao too? And the, the head said, the gangster head said, yes, of course we do. Well, how, how do you see it? How do you understand it? The next slide. Well, uh, uh, the, the, the head, the, the boss or the, 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 the gangster head, he, he has wisdom. A ringleader is able to foretell where the valuables are hidden. So that's called wisdom. So that in, is, that in itself, you know, is uh, a bit uh, odd, isn't it? But the, the head, he also leads the way to a housebreaking. All right? And that is called courage. So he would tell his people, you just follow me and uh, I will have a feel of the things and then you just come behind me, I I'm there first, you know. So that, that is uh, very courageous of him, very nice of him, isn't it? To, to be, that's why he can lead his, his team of robbers and, and thieves. And then when his job is done, he would be the last one to leave the scene. And of course, he called it Kamaradi. You know, well, you, go, you first go, you guys go ahead. And I will be the last to leave. I will protect you all. Wow, that sounds very, uh, very honorable, isn't it? Then, of course, he also weighs the situation carefully before he takes action. And we, uh, he calls it wit. Today is not a good day for action. He would be able to tell. Uh, that, um, uh, a few more days later, I will let you know when is the best time to go and rob. That also is considered leadership there. And, and uh, he, he is considered as uh, having the wit. And he divides the stolen goods evenly among his robbers. And that is called benevolence. And so he said, here, you know, there are 20 talents. Each one of us take five. Isn't it a good leader? <laughs> Isn't he a good gangster head? Well, uh, that's, that's what righteousness can be uh, to different, different people. But this type of righteousness is self type of righteousness. It is according to our own standard of righteousness. It is according to my own preference. So, uh, if I don't feel it is wrong, then it is right. It is, is righteous for me to do or to say or whatever. If I'm not happy with you, then I will hurt you. Uh, it's my right. It's that, that is what I will do, you know. And it's my right in my own sight. I'm right in doing what I'm, uh, I do. I kill you to rob you. I should, be, I, I, want to, I should be doing that. Otherwise, you will catch, the police will catch me. And uh, so, so that is his own sense of righteousness. If it is to his advantage, then I will show you righteousness. There was these uh, two guys in the village. They are very notorious. They rob, they kill, 
and they beat people up, and the whole village people, all of them are afraid of these two brothers. And <laughs> but one day, one of the brother died. And the other brother, the older brother, then went to the pastor of that small village and said, I want you to conduct his funeral. And, uh, and, and um, you know, and in that, if, if you would conduct this funeral, then I'm going to give you a, a very big offering. And of course, the, the small little church, they need renovation, they need whatever help. And uh, so, so that is really very tempting. And on top of that, the big brother says, if in the process of doing your rites, you would call my brother a saint, I'm going to give you a bonus. Wow, on that day of the funeral, the whole village turned up because they all know the, about these two characters and they want to see what would, how would the pastor do it. And, and so the, the service went on and as it would have been done you know, as usual, and towards the end of that uh, rise, the pastor then looked at the older brother. And he says that compared to this brother, he is a saint. <laughs> so, of course, he gets his bonus, isn't it? Well, this is the righteousness of man. And we have our own sense of what is good and what is wrong, uh, what is right and what is not so right. But in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We are all like an unclean thing. And our sense of righteousness, every good thing, every right thing that we have ever done, they are just filthy rags before the presence of God. All that you think that you are so good and so nice, when you come before God's presence, it is just filthy things. So which righteousness is right then? Actually, there's no right or wrong righteousness. It's just a matter of whether your righteousness is acceptable to God. Righteousness which is acceptable to God. This, there is only the righteousness of Jesus Christ which will be acceptable to God. When we stand before God, our own righteousness cannot stand up to God's measurement of right and wrong. No matter how can we can explain ourselves, no matter what kind of circumstance you, it happened, and you can claim and say that it is the right thing to do, it's the best thing to do, then uh, it is still doesn't match up to what God expects. Christ's righteousness is different. Christ's righteousness is a sacrificial type of righteousness. It is the sacrifice of someone who has lived a life that is free from sin and guilt. He who has done no wrongs, he sacrificed his life. The man who is moral and virtuous, justified morally with uprightness and rectitude, the one who shows honesty and integrity, his righteousness is unlike man's, our kind of righteousness. Human beings' righteousness works this way. And it is actually not even appreciated. Because in, in the book of Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 7, it says this way. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Each time when I read these few verses, 
And when I come to verse 7, I always pause and start to think about this verse. What does it really mean? How, how come, you know, uh, if, if uh, there's a righteous man, uh, why scarcely anyone would die for this righteous man? Who, what, someone who is, you know, who is honest and in, t- integral in his ways, uh, someone who lived right you know, to all that we know. Uh, but nobody would want to die for this righteous person. But for a good person, uh, someone may even dare to die. Well, in the living, New Living Translation, it says it this way. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, verse 7, now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know, God has been dealing, you know, with me concerning my ways of thinking and the way I respond uh, to situations. And, uh, and I, I'm kind of struggling, you know, to, to be a good person. Should I be the bad guy or should I be the, 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 bad, uh, the good guy? You know, what, what do you want to be? You, of course, you want to be a good guy, right? And so a good guy would then say things that are pleasant, uh, that is nice, uh, that is very acceptable to, to everyone as much as possible. Uh, but, you know, for, for the, <coughs> on the other hand, if you, if you want to stand up for, for what you think is, is uh, your, your, your best idea, then uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't match or it doesn't flow along. And so you, you, uh, nobody would then like what you are trying to do or what you are trying to say, see? So, so for a, a righteous man, then uh, nobody like would dare to die, would want to die for that kind of a person. But if you are a kind and a nice guy, then perhaps someone would uh, come, uh, be, be willing to die on your behalf. So if, let's say, you are crossing the road and a car is coming and speeding down the road and, and uh, your friend saw you, you know, and because you are such a good guy, so this, your friend, will then run in between the car and you and then get himself killed because he's willing to sacrifice for a good person. But if it is for someone uh, who, who is right and righteous, um, this, this friend would not rush in. He will just let the car knock you down, in other words. But Jesus is different. Jesus is willing, and he's more than willing to sacrifice himself, to shed his blood for those who are not good, even for those who are against him, whether you are righteous or unrighteous in your own sight, whether you're considered a good person or not so good person. Because None of us will ever match up to what God expects from us. We are all of our goodness, all of our righteousness is only filthy rags before God's sight. But Jesus came and he died for our sins. He is more than willing to die even for you who thinks, who, who, who is against him, who doesn't live uh, a life that honors God who in fact do things that displeases God. You, your, your life, your behavior is such that it's un- dishonorable. But yet Jesus, and that's, and yet Jesus came and died for you. Je- Jesus sacrificed himself so that we can be made right. Righteousness can only be accounted to our favor. It is, it is like a bank account. You got an ATM card, you want to go and withdraw money. Well, if there's no money inside, how, what's there to withdraw? You can put your ATM card inside, there's still nothing come out. No money will come out. So you have to go and deposit money first into that account. Then you can use your ATM card and go and withdraw money. Well, if you are running short of righteousness, you have been living a life that is, uh, um, you know, that, that has all, that you have done so many wrongs in life. But even if you have been living a good life, you try your best to live right. Assuming that you have done 100 good things in your life in this one week, 
But if you have done one wrong thing in this one way, then it, it's still, you are still guilty. You, you are still, you know, guilty before God. It doesn't make right, even though you have 100 right things done, or 100 good things done. If you would just do one wrong only, if you would just think one wrong thing, one wrong thought, that, is already, that already makes you guilty of sin and punishment and of that. It could be just a wrong thought. It could be just a wrong word spoken that hurts someone. It could be even a wrong feeling that you have, a feeling of unforgiving because someone has hurt you directly or maybe indirectly or unknowingly. And you are not able to forgive that person. Jesus, he died for us. He who have no sin, so that we can, we who have sinned, will be made without sin. It then become, is accounted to us as righteousness. And only this type of righteousness that is from Jesus is acceptable to God the Father. Only then will God heal from heaven and heal you. Righteousness is important in prayer. You and I, normal people, meaning imperfect. Not, we are all very normal, imperfect people, meaning. Uh, we can experience great power in prayer. Why? Because James says in James chapter 5, verse 16 to 18, he says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah, verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That means imperfect, all right? Normal people. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Weather is not something that we can just simply control and pray and say, oh God, you know, let there be no rain in Penang or in the whole of Malaysia. How is God going to answer your prayer, you know? The farmers will cry if there's no rain for, for, for one whole week. Uh, you, 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 don't, you don't want rain because it's flooding your house and your, your, it's reaching your rooftop. Uh, and so sometimes we, we have to, uh, in this situation, in this particular case, somehow Elijah, when he prayed, God heard his prayer. And there was no rain. And he prayed again in verse 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So God responded to the prayer of Elijah, someone who is very ordinary, just like you and me. But... We know that most of us don't have that kind of a power with God. Why? Because there are wrongs in our life. Because there are sins that hinders our prayer. It is not that God cannot answer prayer. And it's not that God is not able to do what you pray for. It is that your prayers is hindered, are hindered. How? Does it happen? When we speak bad about another person, speaking bad about another person, some people, they enjoy whispering into people's ears. And those, these people who talk bad about others, they speak very gently and they speak very softly so that nearby people cannot hear it. And you think that you are talking about the other person, well, probably you are talking be, uh, about the other person behind the person's back or behind closed door. And he will not hear it. Even if he hears about it eventually, he won't know that it is you who, who started that story about him. But God hear it. James, uh, James chapter 5, verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. You told that you, were, you, 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 stand, you, you talk behind closed door. But the judge stands at the door. Family, within our family, 
relationship. There are lots of hindrances to our prayer. Your prayer is hindered when you have family relationship issues that is hurting one another in the home. The scripture tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some who do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be warned by the conduct of their wives. So no point trying to say that, oh, he doesn't make good decisions. So why should I do what he says? I, my idea is better. My, my thinking, my, my, my explanation is better. Uh, after all, I earn more than he earns, you know. So, so of course, I should be the one making the, the, the choice and the decision. But that's what the scripture says. I'm not trying to, you know, counsel you. This is not a counseling session. I'm only uh, reading from the scripture and explaining what the scripture is saying. As long as it is amoral, whatever that issue that, you, know, that you, you have with one another as husband and wife, as long as it's amoral, as long as you have been given a chance to explain, to express your opinion, uh, do your best to explain your best judgment that it is best. If he disagree with you, then you just... Give way, submit. I mean, like I say, I'm not counseling you, so I'm not in the situation to tell you exactly who is wrong. I'm not telling you who is right and who is wrong. I'm just merely saying that the scripture tells us, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husband, that even if they do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be warned by the conduct of, your wife, of, of the wives. Then Peter will go on and says, husband, Likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Wow, the husband's prayer is particularly brought up that it can be hindered. You as the man, you know, uh, your prayers is not effective. Why? Because you have not dwelt with your wife with understanding, not giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life. So when you argue with your spouse and you scold her or you belittle her and, and have not settled it with your wife, then your prayers are hindered. At the end of the day, you go and pray for your children, whatever, whatever else, you know. It's just empty words. You expect God to hear your prayer and answer your prayer? No. It's hindered. It's like, you know, it just doesn't go out beyond that, 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 the, the four walls of that room. We have to learn to give honor <coughs> to the wife. Giving due consideration to their ideas, to her weaknesses. I mean, her funny ways or what her funny way of doing things or thinking and deciding things, you know. As to a weaker vessel. If you don't, you, you, then you end up, you know, you know, unsettled in that way, then your prayers will be hindered. No wonder you pray, 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 you know, you still got no answer. Please take note of what Peter says. In working relationship, also, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle. And we like, we are, it's easier to submit huh? or to follow the guy, the instruction of those who are, who are very kind and gentle to you. But also to the harsh, for this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. So you, didn't, you do everything right. And yet, your boss is still not happy with you. Uh, and yet, you are not uh, you know, getting whatever, whatever the result that he, he, he wants and expects from you. Uh, and then you still get scolding and you don't get promoted. The other people get promoted. It's all right. <laughs> it's okay. You know? You suffer wrongfully for, for right living. Now, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, 
If you are being beaten, you are being punished for the, your wrongdoing, for being disobedient, for whatever you know, you've been told to do and you didn't do, then what's there to complain? What's there to cry to God and say, God, my boss is not fair, you know? I, your small little thing also pick on me. What for? It's you yourself. You deserve it, it says here. And uh, for what credit is, is it if when you're bidden for your faults, you take it patiently. You just close your mouth, shut your mouth, and just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, then it is commendable before God. God is pleased with you. Whatever you say in your prayer, God is going to hear you. For to this you were called, verse 21, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's our, our normal response is we always want to you know, answer back. We always want to you know, talk back and uh, speak back in return. But no, that's not the right way. Yeah. He, did not re- he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. You have a choice to make. You want to live right before God. You don't want to just live, you know, fight for your own right and be right and look right. But by whose stripe you were healed, and for you were, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Wow. You know, I mean, which one of us in here can do that uh, in the office working environment? Don't fight back. Don't talk bad. How? Uh, don't argue for your right. <laughs> Who can do that? It's not easy. This is not just for uh, it, this is not just the unfairness which a Christian faces at workplace. This is also the unfairness which non-Christian faces in the workplace. That is why you and I should show by our exemplary life. It is you who is right outside there, engaging the people daily in your working life, that you would show an exemplary life. And by your reassuring words that there is a God in heaven, there is a God on earth who judges with truth and with righteousness. Can you learn to depend upon God? Would you learn, would you rather submit to God instead of going into a fight, instead of trying you know, to do things and hurt the, the, the person, the other party, or doing something that would hurt the company or things like that? Would you, would you learn, would you be willing to allow God to take over and let him prove, back, prove you right instead? The next thing that can hinder our prayer is disrespectful. Being disrespectful is actually pride. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You who is of the younger generation, learn to respect the elders, especially your parents. You, have, you better learn to respect your parents and honor them in all things which are immoral. If there is nothing morally wrong with what their advice is, Learn to respect what uh, their words. Don't try to fight for your right to go and stay overnight with your friends overnight. Don't try to fight for your right to, to come back late at, home, uh, late at, at night for, uh, to home. Learn to, 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 to listen to what the elders have to say. 
to what your parents have to say to you especially. That you may live long. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 4 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is right. Honor your, par- your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. That is the, the only commandment in the Old Testament that has a promise that comes along with it, a promise of blessing, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Not just merely live long and then suffer in pain and all these things. But you may live long and live well. Be respectful. Learn to honor. And, and you know, learn to su- submit to one another. That, those that have authority over you. We have to watch out in our daily living. These are the signs of the last day. These types of sins are not caused by the last day because it's the last day, that's why these things are happening. No. These things are happening is showing to us these, these sins are signal. It's a sign of the last day. What does the last day mean? It means that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He's returning. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7. to 7. But, <laughs> but know this. That in the last day, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, they are headstrong, they they are haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying His power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We have to really open up our eyes we have to really search our own ways and thinking and make sure that, that, that there is no hindrances in our own life. That we will live a life that is righteous before God. Our righteousness, no matter how right you may be, no matter how well you can explain, no matter how logical you, you can present it, your righteousness, my righteousness, is just like filthy rags before God. And God will only accept us on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Only when we come to God and say, God, I've sinned. I'm a sinner. I need you. Jesus, I need you to cleanse my sin. And I'm coming to God, to you, God, and present myself a holy sacrifice. God, it is not easy to obey all that you have said in your word. God, it is not easy, you know, to live this manner in relationship with people at home, especially at home and in the workplace. But God, I'm willing to allow you to take over, to help me, to live that way so that, God, my prayers will not be hindered. (coughs) Let's bow our heads in prayer. And as we pray this morning, recognize that God is right here. God is not very, very far away in heaven. Yes, He is in heaven. But His presence, His presence, the glory of His presence fills this earth. And He is present here, right here, in our midst. Don't be so quick to answer God. Don't be too quick to speak before God's presence. But rather, just come before God and say, God, 
I just want to love you. I just want to honor you. And I come by the blood of Jesus Christ. God, I come not by my own righteousness, the good things, the right things that I've done, the right manner of mannerism. Not because I've come on a Sunday morning, every Sunday. God, I come to you because you are present here. And I just want to honor you and respect you and praise you and just worship you. And as you come by the power of the blood of Jesus, you then present whatever you may have need of to God. And God will answer you. Because you are not just merely saying words in prayer. It's no more just saying words of prayer. It's because you are right here in the presence of this Almighty God. And you have been made right before God. And God will listen to you. And He will heal you. And He will touch you. And He will change your life. Whatever that you are struggling with, lay them aside. Put it, lay them down at this altar. And just enjoy the presence of God. And He will just touch you. You will experience it real. It's not going to be just a song that you sing with a very nice tune. I want you to experience God's presence right here. And you will experience His power coursing through your whole being. And He will be there when you go home. And He's going to bless your home. He's going to heal your family, your home relationship. If you are husband and wife, Come together. Lay aside rights and wrongs. Forgive and just forget everything. Yeah, it's not easy to forget. But when you're in the presence of God, it's different. There's no more such things. You're free. You're able to love one another. You're able to care for one another. You're able to speak the right things, the good things to one another. You're able to think the right things about your, your office colleagues. Because God has set, will set you free. Because you are in the presence of God. And so as we sing this chorus again, I invite you to come to this altar. Hallelujah, Father. I pray for each and individual that's standing here Lord yes bring a breakthrough in our own personal Amen. lives Heavenly Father that's bring right. a breakthrough Lord in our relationships yes. with one another yes because today we are submitting we're submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Amen. Christ he's Amen. the Lord of every situation yes. and we submit to you Lord in simple yes. obedience to do what you say it may seem foolish Lord in the eyes of the human in the, before human eyes yes but it is wisdom in the eyes of the Lord Amen. and so I ask yes, your I blessing I ask for the grace of God that is sufficient to carry us through oh, that we will yes. be that light and that salt that will glorify Amen. and people will see our lives and our humility and our obedience to you will say truly we serve a great and mighty God I pray your blessing I pray the grace of God the love of God to keep us mind soul and body for your honor and for your glory in Jesus wonderful name lift your hands and now just begin to worship